we can do you know, our morning session with a talk by four, four, four modules, which is going to tell us about three months of short duration of your Thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, so what I want to talk today is um, a topic that uh, um, maybe most of the people here have seen me talk about. So I want to um, um, update the topic with some kind of uh, developments in light of um, and of some sort of uh, new ideas that um, um, came about uh, this uh, story. And um, so the plan is to give up, to give some motivation um, with, um, and what I decided to do is while preparing this talk, so this is sort of uh, uh, technically um, combinatorially um, heavy to uh, describe rigorously. So um, um, I, I wanted to start to prepare to present a uh, more complicated example. And then uh, while preparing this talk, I kind of try to simplify it as much as possible. So it doesn't become trivial, but it, it still captures some of the um, essential picture, features of the story and kind of the um, new features or new observations. Um, so uh, hopefully it will be illuminating and understandable without, as I said, going into the weeds of the, with the combinatorial machinery. So, of course, it all goes down back to this Gelfand Capano de Levinsky uh, book, if you want, and papers around that, which somehow uh, amazingly uh, still um, um, produce sort of uh, good examples for the mirror symmetry story. So. So um, about, I guess, three, four years ago, maybe four years ago, Aspinall, Plesser, and Wang. Um, so I became aware of this because Aspinall gave a talk um, and then this paper appeared. He gave a talk, I think, um, in Benf, which I was, and where he sort of um, presented the conjecture that, um, about how the toric uh, birational geometry picture works uh, and um, what I, the, the main topic of this work is to um, prove this conjecture um, in some cases at least. So um, I will not, as I said earlier, I will not be able to present all the details. So this is kind of the um, main, um, Machinery is uh, toric uh, stack, stacky geometry. So it involves a multiplication, uh, sorry, multiplicities. And so I will, for most of the talk, ignore those aspects. And then uh, some further directions at, and uh, my main motivation, maybe I'll uh, discuss that at the end. So, uh, so the baby example, as I said, is this, uh, so we, let's start with a uh, weighted projective uh, plane with a singularity with weights uh, one, one, two, uh, blow up the singularity um, and get the Hirzebruck surface. That's one way to get this Hirzebruck surface. Um, so this, the, uh, picture that uh, one sees if you go back to even uh, these papers from early papers of the, in the 90s um, uh, is something along uh, this uh, diagram, although they, uh, the, 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 those days they didn't write it that way. So, um, um, and usually they do work with, um, 
toric fourfolds, and in fact, uh, quasi projective Calabial fivefolds in, in those papers in the 90s. Uh, so, in this case, um, the underlying projective Calabial is a, is a little um, trivial. Well, not quite, but it's going to be a, an elliptic curve inside this um, F2. So many, some of the aspects will not be um, very clear out of this discussion uh, related to that. But for the purposes of this uh, talk, uh, I'll, I'll, well, that aspect of the story will be kind of swept under the rug. So we will look at this quasi-projective um, uh, Toric the Lim Mumford stack with um, with um, trivial canonical bundle. So um, there, the what um, we usually do, um, we kind of try to well, if we want to understand the combinatorics of the describing the birational geometry. Um, we take we start with this uh, total space of the canonical bundle of F two, and then we take its various uh, incarnations of as um, as um, a toric the uh, variationally equivalent toric um, the the lemma for stack. So um, what happens is that. This is sort of nice to encode uh, combinatorially. So um, I, I wrote here the actual picture here. So the way you should view at this. Um, um, so this is kind of the main configuration. So these are the vectors V0, V1, V2, V3, V4, which sit <clears throat> in a hyperplane. So that kind of ensures the fact that we're dealing with um, uh, a quasi-projective Calabial, the, the, this hyperplane condition. And um, then the, uh, the combinatorics, so that's kind of the story of the, this uh, combinatorial machinery of uh, Gelfand kapano zelevinsky is to uh, look at uh, various triangulations, and even more than that, various polyhedral, polyhedral subdivisions. And this is you know, a beautiful story, and I'll, I'll explain some parts of it during the talk. And um, the, from the point of view of uh, birational toric geometry, we're, we're um, going to obtain equivalent models. Uh, for this uh, geometry. So as far as we're concerned in this talk, um, any of those, any of these four corners uh, is as good as any other one. So, uh, so any of these four is fine as far as we're concerned. So this is a little different than um, say the talks um, from yesterday, and so from previously on mirror symmetry, namely that uh, um, we mirror symmetry is a statement about maximally uh, degenerative families. This is not quite there because uh, in a way it's more, it, the whole point of this story is actually understanding the global picture. So this is kind of what the physicist will call the large radius point whose mirror would correspond to the large complex structure point where the monodromy is maximally unipotent and all that. All the other ones are kind of harder to understand uh, geometrically. So, um, so um, yeah, so one more thing. So there is this, so people, of course, many people here, or maybe everybody here is familiar with, um, the combinatorics and how this works. So I'll just say briefly, um, explain briefly what, what, what's here in the middle. And this is what's called the secondary fan. So the idea is that um, 
if you write down the, um, if you want to understand the, uh, this picture as a variation of a, uh, of a GAT quotient, then uh, the lattice of charges, so to speak, is gonna be governed by um, the Gale dual of the vector that we started with. So in the Gale dual, in this case, it's gonna be really read, read off from the relationships, the relations between these vectors. And the gadget that um, uh, deals with this, which uh, encodes this is the so-called uh, secondary fan. And uh, you see the vectors are minus two, zero. Here is zero, one, one, negative one, zero, one, uh, one, zero. And this is a topic that, you know, in toric mirror symmetry um, has been studied quite a bit. And there is this issue of what, um, what does it, how do we encode this? And, uh, you know, so the, in, in one word, this kind of, uh, if you think about the mirror symmetry of projective Calabi-Aus, the, you can think about this uh, toric, uh, the, the secondary fan as uh, governing the, the geometry of the complex moduli space of the mirror. And, you know, there are many issues involved with trying to build um, a stack out of this. And, you know, um, Ludmil, of course, has worked on this. So how do you, what kind of compactification do you use? You, do you think about this as, um, uh, as a stacky fan? The answer is yes. And then what do you do with these multiplicities? And, you know, so there, is, there, is, there are various ways of dealing with this. And, uh, you know, various people have discussed this, people like uh, uh, Iritani and uh, from the mirror point of view on in the symplectic geometry, Ludmil and Gabe and Colin. And so they had to deal with this, these issues. So this is kind of a, um, an important issue, which uh, technically is in a way unpleasant. So the, some, one point of this talk in a way is that somehow in a bit of a miraculous way, uh, this conjecture of Aspinall, uh, Plesser and Wang sort of does away with these technical issues and or to the point that almost, not that it doesn't matter, but it matters, but at least it matters a little less so. So again, you should think about these having here some kind of Toric variety described by this fan in the middle, and these are uh, the each uh, model is corresponds to the one large cone in the secondary fan. All right. So now, what's the uh, general machinery? So you start with this uh, set, which is traditionally called A of, of vectors in a lattice which satisfy, as I said, this uh, hyperplane condition. And what um, uh, Gelfand Kapranov Zelevinsky, this were concerned, there was no mirror symmetry then, or maybe there was in physics, but not understood by that there is a connection even, um, is that uh, the classical discriminant, um, so they were concerned with understanding this classical problem of discriminants uh, for, in this context of A sets. So they call them A discriminants, A determinants, and they develop this beautiful theory. Um, so the connection with mirror symmetry happened when the Batarev realized that um, this uh, machinery of uh, Gelfand Kapranov Zelevinsky and the subsequent uh, system of uh, PDEs that you write down uh, gives actually solutions to um, the periods of the mirror. So in the case of when uh, delta is a reflexive polytope and delta star is the mirror reflexive polytope, then uh, these are period integrals. They're describing the variation of complex structures on the complex side. So that kind of put together the two stories um, 
So let's now go to back to our uh, running example, which um, can, as I said, will continue. So what uh, changed here? So, um, so now I, for technical reasons, um, I will distinguish this point, the large complex structure point or the maximal degeneration point. And um, so, as I said, the issue is how do you compactify, right? So as th th then the issue becomes what kind of, um, comp what kind of coordinates you consider on this moduli space. So if we concentrate our attention at this uh, large complex structure point, the appropriate coordinates, appropriate in quotes, because I haven't explained why and how, um, are exactly the ones determined in a way by the, uh, their, their homogeneous coordinates determined exactly by um, these two uh, relations. Of course, the lattice of relations has dimension two. So in principle, you can take any uh, two vector bases, right? And use those coordinates. And in fact, uh, since, as I said, you think about this as a toric stack, if you move from here to here, there'll be different coordinates here, different coordinates at, at, the, at the points, right? So, but um, at least for this picture, um, that's for the, sorry, for the large complex structure points, these are the coordinates that we want to consider. Um, that's one point. And the other um, new issue is the appearance of uh, these two components. So what, what uh, Gelfand and Karpano Zelevinsky uh, realized, and that's kind of, I guess, the magic, the magic sauce uh, is that, yes, we can, if we just start to study um, the classical discriminant of polynomials, we won't be able to say that much new. Even these days for right, understanding the classical discriminant of one variable polynomials and its topology is a tough problem. So what they realize is that, hey, if we actually look at the various uh, restrictions of this, the generations of these polynomials to the faces of the convex hull of the, um, of the polytope A, that's a much nicer object. So in this case, and the, for the, from the point of view of this story, the interesting phase, faces of, the, of Q are the edges for reasons which are a little bit mysterious, but which are fit well with this, uh, with a homological, prim, uh, homological mirror symmetry story, but they're mysterious, at least for me, even to this point in this GKZ story. And the faces that are with the property that um, the intersection, the integral points on the face are not, do not form a, a simplex. So in our case, um, there is of course the big face, the full polytope, and there is this uh, face which contains the vectors at one, two, and three. So that's why in this picture, there will be two components of the discriminant locus. So that's the so-called primary component. And this is um, the component associated to uh, D gamma. Now, the question is, how do we know how to draw this? Well, in examples, you can draw using software. And the pictures are very complicated. You know, the discriminants are huge. Um, um, so, um, um, you know, this is a s sort of good case scenario where uh, these, uh, the, the, the two components are like this. I'm ignoring here, by the way, some, uh, some coefficients they, which are which play an important role in this story. And uh, what um, what is kind of uh, what 
um, is to, to get some intuition about the discriminants, uh, one part of the story is to look at the, uh, this uh, uh, log map, which is, you know, it's something that uh, I guess Gabe uh, discussed in his talk. So the, the image is gonna be some kind of the, the uh, this amoeba picture uh, in this case. So this is the amoeba picture of the um, primary component and uh, the amoeba of the of D gamma is sort of easier since D gamma turns out uh, is in fact in this coordinates is something like Y equals, I guess Y equals one over four or something like that. I'm not sure if I had it on the previous picture, so. Right, so, so, uh, so again, this is all classical, nothing new in a way that, now the magic uh, ingredient here is this uh, object EA, cause they call it the A determinant, which has, um, which is the product as I promised of all these uh, polynomials corresponding to all the faces. In fact, you can write here for all the faces, uh, the ones that for which A, A, A intersected gamma, um, for the ones for which this is not interesting, they're gonna be one, so not much. And some multiplicities. So which are essential in the story and they're essential in this, if we want to do toric geometry, they're essential in understanding the, the, the stackiness of the picture. So for most, part of this talk, I'm gonna ignore these multiplicities, although, as I said, they make the machinery work, so. So, uh, <clears throat> so as I, this is a remark, I already said this, that uh, the only interesting things are that are gonna show up are the ones when gamma inter intersected A are interesting, so not simply show. And the uh, result that uh, they proved and this is quite remarkable, is the Newton polytope of this uh, A determinant is in fact the secondary polytope of A. So what the secondary polytope was drawn on these su suggested here. So is the uh, dual polytope to the secondary fan. Of course, when you choose this duality, there is an issue about um, um, a choice, uh, but the way to actually express this is you, the uh, Gelfand Kaplan Zelevinsky story produces the secondary polytope, and then you use that to produce the secondary fan if you want. So that's kind of, in a way, more honest. Um, and then um, the picture that um, you get using some kind of uh, moment map becomes in a way more symmetric. So, so in a way, what the, what, the, what the suggestion in this picture is that in this case, the secondary polytope is, are, consists of this uh, quadrilateral. These are the four boundaries, four edges, sorry. And from the point of view of moduli space, um, the edges correspond to rational curves in the moduli space uh, that were described by say the whose compactification is described by the secondary fan. And the, the story is that if we, th this is sort of a, a bit of an unfair picture, but if we kind of push these to infinity, so to speak into to the boundary of the compactification, um, there is exactly one intersection point between the, uh, the amoeba, if you want, these and these rational curves. So, um, so the, the, these rational curves have been, again, beaten to death by many people, uh, including myself. Uh, and they have this magic property that uh, the, in a way, there are only interest, three interesting points, zero, infinity, and some point, if you, we can call it one, although 
not going to be one, of course, and that the position is also important. It has some combinatorial uh, relevancy. Um, and um, so that's sort of, again, uh, important for the story. The, the trouble, in a way, is that uh, in many situations, um, if you try to think about the sort of the rational curve, for example, here, the x-axis itself is part of the discriminant locus. So if you try to think about these rational curves as sort of nice probing mechanisms, you have to be a little careful how you do it because you have to sort of move away the rational curve from the actual boundary and then understand the intersection. So, all right, so, so what's the intuitive picture here? So this is the a picture that, again, it's very uh, schematic, but it kind of captures the intuition I have um, about how things should work. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, a moduli space, which we, we can call, follow these works by physicists, is the uh, Kähler moduli space. Um, I think in, this is not well understood, uh, but I think Bridgeland calls them uh, geometric stability conditions. So uh, they're, it's certainly not the full, um, in examples at least, it's, it doesn't capture the full um, space of stability conditions uh, a la Bridgeland. But in any case, so, um, so what we, the way we picture this, so for, in the modular space, we if we compactify, we'll have this, um, as I said, these, uh, um, the things in, in purple are components of the discriminant locus. Uh, away from the discriminant locus, uh, the, we have equivalences of categories of, and these are, have been verified by the, uh, uh, in uh, the algebraic world, these were, in discussed by Bondalor Love and then Kavamata made the machinery work for the what's needed here, namely in the case of uh, the Lima for stacks. And then, uh, you know, so in other words, they are equivalent and then you want to um, make show that this is consistent with um, this uh, toric machinery for mirror symmetry, namely that means you go to the other side to D modules and uh, in some, work with long time ago with Borisov and Iritani, uh, this was checked that this, this, this is consistent with mirror symmetry, basically. I'll say maybe a few words about that. So, so what um, Aspinall, Plesser and Wang proposed, and this is kind of has been in a way, uh, is not that surprising, but they made it quite precise, is that uh, for each irreducible component of the discriminant locus, there are, spherical functors, uh, so I call them EZ, that's my name for them. Uh, they are spherical functor in the sense of, uh, of, of Anno and Lokvinenko these days, but uh, they are, all of them there have geometrical origin where, uh, so where if you, uh, where, where, they have the follow, where they have the following form, so there is a kind of a, uh, base category DB of uh, coherent sheaves on some Z category um, that maps into through some, this E is supposed to mean the exceptional locus of in birational geometry. And then it maps into the category on X, which is again compatible with the mirror monodromy action. So somehow uh, what happens along a discriminant locus, um, the, this, there is some um, wall crossing phenomena happening. So in other words, the, while you move along the, the um, discriminant locus, sort of these uh, spherical functors do change. How, they, how this uh, um, change happen, happens, uh, we have not discussed, the, have not thought in general, but um, 
it looks like it, it, it kind of captures this whole uh, as a kind of sub topic in a way, uh, these uh, Mori um, birational geometry um, pictures that have been drawn by Ludmila and his collaborators. So, so along each such component, there is a, such a, a wall crossing phenomena. Um, and again, so how they interact is, um, so um, yeah, so there is something that I also ignored on the picture. These, so these are supposed to be these uh, probing uh, rational curves that I discussed earlier. And it, the, the, in a way, the point that I want to make today, the main point is that although they look in general that if you want to understand, for example, the full birational geometry, uh, as we know, more you, can, you have to push the story from Mori contractions to say Sarkisov links and more than that. So the point is that um, it looks like under certain, circumstance, certain circumstances, in fact, it is in fact enough to use these probing rational curves to understand everything. So in other words, to understand this whole picture, it is enough to understand um, what's going on at, this, at these boundary points. Uh, these boundary rational curves. Because you see, when for me at least, for a long time looked like if I want to understand something far away from the um, large complex structure point, it seemed that we have to go deep in the moduli space and then we run into very, even analytically, we run into very complicated problems about how to analytically continue because the convergence break down, breaks down. The amoeba has holes in the middle, so it becomes technically very hard to do. The point of this is, looks like we may not need, uh, at least in many cases, we don't need to do that. So I hope to convey that. What is the thing that you're Oh, I'm trying to match, to understand, to show that these uh, spherical functors to understand number one, to prove that the, along any, uh, for each component, I can define, I can define uh, such a spherical functor uh, combinatorially. So if you, if you tell me the combinatorial picture, I can tell you at this curve, what the spherical functor is. And then um, to show you how they, um, if when I move along a component, how they, relate through this, through some kind of wall crossing phenomena, which it basically will boil down to some kind of uh, uh, semi-orthogonal decomposition, which number one. And number two, I want to have a way to check that this actually matches the monodromy action on the mirror side, which I haven't explained yet. Right. Right, but for example, if I want to understand what's going on here, uh, it's very hard to do that check. Uh, I want to generate it by that, that's right, but if I want to understand uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, so these, what's gonna happen here with the, these, in these components, in many cases, the, they, they will be the expectation. I mean, you can actually prove in examples that in many cases there is tangency. So maybe I didn't, so for example here, yes. So many points, um, there is, uh, the, the, there's the rational curve, the red one, and then various components of the, uh, discriminant locus. So if I want to prove to match uh, the spherical functor corresponding to this, um, to a certain component to a monodromy action, it looks like if I'm connect, if I'm around a, a point like this, I'm, I cannot do it basically. Does that make sense? No, no I mean, on, on the A side, 
Right. Um, over a, um, in the local system of categories, which you can compute whatever monochrome you want. And you know um, my, yes, but I cannot do it in practice. In principle, yes. But in practice, if I want to, yes. Well, well, I can't do it in practice. Because it, as I said, that the only thing I want, I know how to do is move along these rational curves, essentially. I mean, I don't know how to do, you're, you're, ask, you're saying to compute this abstractly at the level of Fukaya. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do that. The only, you know, the only way I know how to do it is write down the hypergeometric functions, do some analytic continuation, and look at that formula for a long time and give an interpretation of it as an easy spherical function. So in other words, that's why I'm forced to move around here. I don't know how to go there, but maybe, of course, I'm not an analyst, so that's okay. been... But anyways, uh, but I mean, anyway, that's at the end. The, the problem is, can you tra can you translate this into the Fukai language? Maybe that will make it very clear. I agree. So yes, yeah. Please. Yes, so that that I can match them along these red curves. But if the only, you know, if I want any more complicated calculation, for example, for an example like this, if I want to do, so you see, let's say we want to, so maybe this will answer this question. So let's say we want to understand the monodromy, so okay, so let me say the, the, this folklore, actually not folklore, was presented by Konsevich in a talk long time ago, that if you look at the a Tory case where the Calabiao say, you have a projective Calabiao inside a um, complete intersection in a smooth, projective Calabiao in which sits inside, which is a complete intersection inside some kind of a funnel. Um, then the monodromy around this in the, if you write periods and you compute the monodromy, uh, the monodromy around this should correspond to the Fourier multifunctor, which is corresponding to the um, structure sheaf of the Calabiao, which we know it's a spherical object. So in other words, the spherical functor is the, the simplest one, but the most interesting one, which sends the point to the structure sheaf of X, say for the quintic. So the OX is spherical. So that, that's this uh, folklore conjecture. Well, it's, I don't know, I maybe shouldn't, folklore is not a good name because it was stated like that. So, so how do we prove this? Yes, in, if I understand correctly, in uh, mirror symmetry, what you do, this is kind of embedded in any proof of mirror symmetry. In other words, you know, you can think about even in the SYZ language, this S3, this, this corresponds to the S, the vanishing S3, which is the basis of the SYZ vibration, which collapses. But in a way, in that proof, that is kind of part of the data. You, if I understand, you put it by hand when you can, you built, it's built in by hand into the proof of mirror symmetry. That's how I understand it. Many ways. <laughs> so, so for me, if I want to do that, as I said, using this machinery with the, what, which I'll say maybe a word or two about this topological mirror symmetry map here, I, I, I want to really compute this by going around, by computing, taking a loop, and com computing the monodromy of some system of PDs. And unfortunately, if I start at this point, you see, if I go on, on this, on the rational curve, the red one, when I go around it, actually it's gonna be, there will be some grading involved because I'm gonna have a double intersection. So I have to do, you know, I have to get into the business of, Moishe Zon and, you know, Zariski and Mina is here. So, you know, of trying to understand this grading 
and writing a representation and then computing all these and you know multiplying matrices and all that. So, and it turns out in this example, for example, that is true. Well, let me just make sure yeah. On, on the A side, we have uh, uh, some function of C star G N. And we were discussing the integrals, but I could also just discuss the fact that. Right, exactly. And then you have some discriminant focus, which has to do with when this function is singular in general. Right. Subject. And you want to know uh, what is the monitor in the entire category around the discriminant focus. And moreover, um, how do you express that in terms of coherent uh, treatment? That's the point. That, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, so the calculation here, even in this example, is very the one the the point the one that I knew how to do. I mean, the before this machinery, with this observation of uh, Aspinwall plus N one, this looked pretty daunting, and you know it can be done, but it's complicated. Basically, what with this observation um, and this new more recent technology of spherical functors, it turns out that even in this example, it becomes quite a, just a remark, basically, at the end of the, so. Yeah, so there, as I said, there, there are lots of people who, uh, uh, I, I, I just wanted to put some names. So this, this whole picture started uh, with Aspinall, Green, and Morrison. I mean, this in the Tory context starting earlier before that. Then of course, this all goes to the story about windows by Herbst, Corey, and Page, and then uh, Ludmil and the various groups of people, Halper Leisner, and then there is a paper by Halper Leisner and Shipman when they deal with this. And more recently, the last two, three years, uh, Siegel and I hike his student. And then related to this in a special case of what's called a quasi-symmetric case, I, I talked about that at some point, um, um, Spenko and uh, Van den Berg proposed what they call the categorification of the GKZ system, which in that case, which is very special and life is very easy, but they do uh, the categorification of the, of the GKZ system. So uh, that corresponds to the, what I think I would call the uh, Lorentz, the toric variety being a Lorentz variety. So. Okay, okay. So, um, so let me uh, again explain quickly here. So these are the curves, as I already mentioned. These are you can do um, try to take these loops, right? And uh, you're going to run into problems here where you have double multiplicity, and here where the this, these two components of the discriminant um, do intersect. And on the other end, right here. Life is, so this point sort of isolates the principal component and this point isolates the component corresponding to the interesting face, as I said. Um, there is, by the way, the, the Aspinall calls it wall monodromies. So these are all, as I said, the, the easy functors. So they're all wall monodromies. Um, and there is something uh, called horn uniformization written by Kapranov a long time ago of the of these components of the discriminant. The problem is that that the, the, that map is only birational. So uh, uh, so they're they're all rational. The problem is, of course, the interesting point which you need might be um, the one that where the you don't have locally it's not amorphous. So so um, so what. Now I have to say, I, I said I'm not going to do anything technical, but I still have to say a little bit. So what uh, um, the way GKZ um, described this Newton polytope of, of this A discriminant is the following. So these are AIs are co the coefficients corresponding to the vectors VIs. So the monomials um, are of the form AI to the power PI, where the PI is the sum of the volumes of um, uh, the maximal, uh, maximal simplices sigma, such that VI is a vertex of sigma. 
So in a way, what they uh, what the magic that I was mentioning earlier is that if you just take the these triangulations and you produce these uh, um, these, these monomials, then you take the convex convex hull of these and you get the Newton polytope of the um, um, of the um, a, a determinant. So, um, so you know, so get in this picture, the only new ingredient is that these are the dominant monomials, and they're obtained by simply doing a little bit of algebra in this example. That's why I chose it because otherwise, of course, life gets very complicated. So now the point is that asymptotically about the, these curves, the red curves, that for some reason there is only one there, um, you can actually use these, you can understand, since you know the two monomials, you can know asymptotically how this edge is gonna look like. And what you see here, for example, is that if you, you know, write down explicitly that you use that formula with the volumes, you see that you actually do get the multiplicity two, which corresponds exactly to this multiplicity two. So the, the question is, hey, if we have the, that the point where we have transversality, uh, life should be much better. Um, and you can do the same thing for this intersection. So this is, this is the other component of discriminant and you can compute this, do exactly the same little calculation. And you see that it comes out as one minus uh, asymptotically has this form. So at y equals one, you get the intersection. So it's a simple intersection. <clears throat> okay, so now <clears throat> this is kind of, um, you know, uh, basically the only new thing here is that uh, this has to be worked out in this context of, uh, so the, it basically it states that these wall monodromies determine spherical functors, no surprises here. Uh, you can express this in the language of windows, as I said already, um, but in the, this has, you know, I, I just wanted to state it here that this has to be taken into account for, this has to be written down for, in this case, for, uh, the Lim Hong for stacks, in particular, this may not be a reduced stack. On the other hand, if you go back to this paper I wrote a long, long time ago about easy spherical functors, the proof is absolutely formal. So uh, that the, as long as the hypotheses are satisfied, um, there is nothing to add there. And then uh, the second part, again, the induced twist is given by this uh, associated, this wall monodromy associated to the, the, the um, fiber product of E over this Z, but which again, in this case, it's a little complicated, but uh, um, so now the important proposition here if, that is that if gamma is a face of the polytope and cir the circuit, um, uh, will in, the, the corresponding curve to the circuit will intersect that the uh, component of the discriminant corresponding to the uh, face will not intersect unless C is a subset. So in a way this restricts, the, this helps us a lot because it tells you kind of the local picture along the faces. So you know, in a way you only have to worry about the circuits that um, live inside the face. And so the, the two conditions are that, um, that we have to consider is that it's not, this is not an, um, probably an, not probably, definitely not an if and only statement, but if you take a circuit whose uh, dimension is equal to the dimension of the face and basically what this condition is saying that inside this, every circuit, is a, so a circuit is, a, as I said, a minimal dependent. So you can take the 
the cone, if you want, determined by this minimally dependent set. So what you want to have is that you have no other points of A inside this. So if, you, if that is true, then uh, the intersection uh, of, between this discriminant component and the rational curve is transversal at the open part. So basically, what the advanced, the, the, what this is saying now is that um, this you do that the wall monodromy, really the one you can compute through the help of the Fourier Mukai factor machinery and with the help of the on the mirror side using these monodromy calculations at the level of hypergeometric functions, they do give you exactly this the proposed uh, Aspinall. Uh, Lesser Wang uh, spherical functors. I guess I anticipated the second part. So, <clears throat> so, and this is what I already said that this this proves the con this Concevich conjecture, which again, depending what well, how do you want to interpret it, in probably in the Fukaya languages doesn't say anything. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the way I want to interpret it is, um, you know, I have a statement about free and Mukai functors, and I have a statement, if you want, about differential equations, and I know the statement about differential equations is a statement about periods of mirror Calabi apps. So do, do the monodromies match? Before this kind of, I didn't know how to, I mean, I knew how to do it in a few examples with a lot of effort, so by this, uh, for example, as I said, in the case of reflexive polytopes, um, you can prove that the spherical twist is really associated to this OX. So as I mentioned already. So just to uh, say a few words about this, the situation here, what's going on. So along here, for example, this is the classical case where you uh, take, so this would be the, um, Weighted projective space, you blow it up. Uh, and again, this is the spherical functor. Uh, the, right, so the, um, and uh, the, the fact that, um, yeah, so this, you, you know, you have a, the, um, P1 is the exceptional locus. Uh, and then the other one corresponding to alpha, this is geometrically, if you want to do uh, mirror symmetry at the level of projective varieties, in other words, if you want to do mirror symmetry at the uh, level of the elliptic curve inside F2, this is something that you don't see, in fact. So this is you know, something that you don't see for the projective, but uh, so you have to go to, this is what's called a hybrid, Space. So you have to, this is going to be, is going to be a combination of uh, lambda Ginsburg and uh, geometry. And then finally here you go to this, I haven't written this down, but here the, you'll have a, a gradient lambda, lambda Ginsburg for the projective uh, Calabiao variety. Uh, you'll have a graded lambda Ginsburg model and Orlov theorem will tell you the equivalence, but uh, at the level of, again, we're just, I wanted to emphasize that we're not doing that here. We're only considering the ambient toric story. So, okay, so now uh, just a few words, two words about this, the machinery on the mirror side, at least the machinery that I'm thinking about is that the, uh, the way I, I want to connect uh, the two sides is through this map by, depending who you want, goes back to, in fact, Givental in his first papers in mirror symmetry, he wrote this down. He, that, um, well, I guess it maybe goes down, goes back to Baturev, in fact. And then Givental, it's kind of the essential ingredient in uh, Givental and mirror symmetry proof. And this is kind of, so basically it, it's really, um, it's a map from the dual of the K theory to so forth. If you give me a, uh, an element in the dual here, you get 
uh, a gamma series solution. Um, if, if you haven't worked with these, they look very weird. So the, the, basically the, the sum here is over the log, uh, log choices here for uh, Ris, where Ris are the classes corresponding to the vectors Vi. So, so I'm not gonna say much about this, but as I said, I, uh, that's kind of uh, behind the scenes on the, what I call the mirror side. And then um, the, the point that I was making earlier is that in the transversal case, uh, this, the induced Fourier Mukai functor from, the, um, from this Fourier Mukai functor associated to, to the, um, um, <clears throat> to the fiber product matches this, uh, analytic continuation uh, map where you sort of move in this rational curve. So you go from zero to infinity and you come back on a non-trivial loop. And the, the, the calculation here is technically a little bit more involved that, so there is some technicalities mainly because, uh, and uh, I'm not even mentioning this, but the, the, hypergeometric system that I'm using here has to be a little bit adapted and generalized to this, what I called with Boris of the better behaved hypergeometric system, so. Okay, so now just, uh, I have maybe three more minutes. Let me uh, explain the more, the general picture that kind of uh, what I'm, basically what I think this, the, this should clarify this. Uh, independently in a way of mirror symmetry. So, so what, what, what's going on is that what Gelfanka, Panov, Zelevinsky did uh, in these uh, papers, they actually wrote down this uh, D module and um, they identify completely up to multiplicities, the characteristic cycles, the characteristic cycle and its character. So in fact, these, um, uh, um, components of the, the, the product of this A determinant is determined exactly. The, so these U of gamma that were these multiplicities are exactly the multiplicities of the, um, of the components of the characteristic cycle. So the interesting part here is that in the characteristic cycle, not only what I call the interesting faces, gamma are gonna give components. All the faces are gonna give some components some of them are kind of trivial, but they still are middle dimensional in the cotangent space of CN. So, so basically, and this, the, the, the story is that for each phase gamma of the polytope Q, if you take this uh, toric embedding determined by the set A, this is gonna be, it will give you a, a, a toric variety, uh, which generally, in general is not gonna be normal, but you take a, a, a space or you take for each face, you take this co-normal bundle. So this is very, it's reminiscent. It's a comp complexified version, by the way, of this um, Bondal and uh, Zaslov and Nadler and many other people. Sorry, I'm forgetting names, but this is kind of the complexify. So this is for me very, it's been mystifying for years now. Uh, what's the connection between this characteristic cycle in, the, in this uh, real stratification uh, that shows up? And I guess Vivek also used this recently actually for a you know, proof of mirror symmetry. So, but in any case, so there are, um, these components are, so in a way it should, it looks like this should be the natural place where we should, so we have a, you know, we have a, a characteristic cycle, we know multiplicities, we, so we can write down a Whitney stratification and maybe write down a Schober, which I don't know how to do. So uh, is there a Schober induced by the characteristic cycle? So I'd love to know, I don't know how to do this. And number two, I guess that 
is there a Fukaya type version of, of such a Schober? So, uh, so a few years ago, I gave a talk about some Schober, sort of, which is still not written down. Um, this is not, this talk is not about that Schober. That Schober is in a way the dual of this one. So this is the more interesting one. This is even then, this is what the Schober, I, I don't know how to construct this Schober. So this also kind of, we can call this Schober, the category, categorification of the GKZ, D module. I don't know how to do it, but um, it, it certainly looks like, uh, as I said, that this story about that all the combinatorial data is, uh, com is contained in this characteristic cycle and the multiplicities make, make this story a little bit complicated, but uh, maybe there is hope now um, since we kind of understand combinatorially on the B side, what, what to expect for what kind of functors to expect corresponding to these uh, different strata. So we do have now a proposed uh, combinatorial description, how to first, how to define a higher dimensional Schober number one. And uh, maybe this can um, serve as a guiding principle. So I should say there, there are some, there is some work here by Donovan um, and even uh, Bondal Kapranov and Schechtman, I think they, they wrote a paper where they deal with this. They built a, a higher dimensional Schober in the case of a hyperplane stratification. So, um, which is a, it is a version of exactly this, what's on this page of such a characteristic cycle. But um, of course, everything is easier when you intersect hyperplanes versus you intersect cycles here. On the other hand, as I said, all the multiplicities, so the multiplicity of the components with the zero sections are understood combinatorially here. So maybe something can be done. Thank you. Okay. Isn't it obvious how to find the strawberry? It's like kind of category of the three dimensions. Of the, sorry? You, you, you have, I mean, over, over your space, you have a family of uh, C star at the end, and the function varies over your space with parameters. Those over each, at least smooth point, I mean, in a way for discriminant, they have a kind of category. Right. On discriminant, they open set, they have a kind of category of three dimensions. Yeah, I don't know what, I mean, we can. Uh, the, the, what do you do when the components intersect, for example? <laughs> Maybe if you show me that, then. I mean, it, in a way, I think you, you, I don't know, a few years ago, we wrote a paper called the proof of, simple proof of mirror symmetry for chloric varieties, right? Yeah, sounds like Yeah, so isn't that, so that somehow should deal with exactly the same issues. That yeah, and that's why I was asking this question. Yeah, I think it would uh, be easy to get to the Okay, that should be. But, but I, my other question was about this, um, this, uh, this conjecture, uh, the one that you mm -hmm. so, so these guys, they wrote down explicitly spherical functors or you have to really guess what they are? Well, there are some issues with their, with their conjecture. No, I mean, I, their conjecture is, let's say, generally correct, but they, because of this tackiness that it has to be a little modified. I'm asking what their conjecture is, that they exist spherical functors or they write one down and they say it's this one. No, they write, the ver they write something down that right. has to be a little bit adapted in, according to what we believe. So, yeah, but they do write down their functors. And of course, they do not claim that they cannot prove that they're spherical, but they say, look, these are the functors, they should be spherical. Yeah, and the way you prove is functors are spherical. They're or spherical, or and then they, they, a little bit of footwork to for to make this work. So yeah. Yeah, 
Maybe. <laughs> you see, so there, anyway, there, we can talk about this. There is something here too, because you see those Z. So if you, if you want to do vanishing cycles, so, you know, it's natural to, from the point of view of D modules, when you take the discriminant locus, Kashiwara says, look at the vanishing or the nearby cycles. And the vanishing cycle is the kind of has regular singular points. Um, on the other hand, this the Z's that we get here, they're not Calabia. So that's why you'll get these wall crossing phenomena where you, you know you have this machinery with Mori, some kind of Mori version with some semi-orthogonal decomposition, which you don't see in the Calabia. So that and if you try to write down uh, there the D module. That one will have irregular singularity. So you have to kind of make a choice about the, which periods matter, which are which are convergent. Uh, anyway, so the, the, so that he does or does not. No, it's contact. Yeah, I mean I. Love to see look at this. Oh, uh, that's good. Oh, let's say four again. 